This yes, conference will now be recorded. Okay, this is the Monday, July 6th uh, work session for Albany City Council. I'll call the meeting to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes, sir. Um, Councilors Coburn? Here. Essie Johnson? Here. Alex Johnson? Here. Kellum? Here. Olson? Here. Dykes? Here. And I guess Mayor Canopa? Here. Uh, six counselors present. Uh, next is business from the public, public, but I don't believe we have any, do we? Um, I don't think so, Bill. No. I believe in the early email. Yeah, I was about ready to say, Marilyn, do we have any? Public? <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's go on to the uh, Parks and Rec fee adjustment, uh, and is Kim online? Yes, Kim, you're muted, or can't hear you. It's sure you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Where's Dick at? I don't see Dick's picture. <laughs> I, I I can't see anybody, so I don't know if Kim is here or not. No, she's she's here, Bill. But um, she's and and her microphone shows green, but we can't hear her talking. Correct. And Kim, I'd invite you if you can hear me. I'd invite you to come over here and present if you want to. Okay. Um. Well, is uh, Shane available? We could move on to the fire and safety fee adjustment. Yes. Yeah, or uh. Here. Can everybody all right, hear let's, me all right? Let's, uh, do... Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. All let's right. Let's go to well, you, Shane. Off... We'll come back in later. Okay. First off, hello, council mayor, fellow staff. Uh, before we get started, I hope everybody had a great Fourth of July. I can tell you from the fire department's perspective, it was a busy day with 40 plus calls. Uh, just so you know, council and mayor, uh, we received as the fire department nine different. Uh, fireworks complaints. We had three uh, small grass fires and a couple injuries as a result of the 4th of July festivities. So a busy day uh, nonetheless. So before we get into the feed, I'm actually not going to do the uh, presentation. Instead, I want to introduce you to your fire marshal, Laura Ratcliffe. Uh, Laura <laughs> been with the department for eight years where she has steadily uh, moved up in the fire and life safety division uh, up until October, late October, when we got her in the right position where she is our city's fire marshal. So with that introduction, uh, Laura, it's all yours. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to go over these fees. Um, this is my first one, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> you can go over our proposal or just ask for questions. I'm just going to give a brief explanation of both of the pieces, and then they'll ask questions if they have them. Got it. Okay, so the first one is going to be um, an additional operational fee that we're requesting. Um, it's a new licensing item that has come from the state for auto dismantlers and we're actually not quite sure how many in Albany and uh, Lynn County I'm my best guess is less than three um, people dismantle vehicles as part of their business and so as such their license from the state the state is requiring that they have an annual inspection from um, the fire jurisdiction. And so similar to what we do for daycares and other licensed facilities, um, we're requesting that we are able to implement um, a fee to do this annual inspection. Um, keeping with the same 125 that we do for the other operational permits that we have. Um, and the second item is repeat code violation um, fine that we are considering implementing 
and that is more for kind of repeat offenders. There's um, a handful in the community when we go out to do a business inspection, they're um, blocking exits or not having their fire service like alarms or sprinklers, their annual service. We speak to them about it. We educate them. They perform and get in compliance. And then when we go to the same people two or three years later, the same uh, violation has been repeated. And this is with the same people that we know we've talked to about it. And these are the major fire and life safety items. We're not concerned with people using extension cords over and over. It's, you know, the block exits, them not their fire alarm and sprinkler. So our request is rather than give them three inspections for free, we would like to, at the first inspection, if they haven't corrected the issue, um, to find them. So, in essence, they already got their re-inspections the first time we were there years ago. Um, so we just kind of want to nip it in the bud and um, just have people do the right thing. And again, it's just a handful of folks. Um, the number that is on the, the, um, the bottom of the budget impact showing at $2,000 annually, that's um, incorrect. I, that it's actually closer to eight hundred dollars what that would be any questions um, there's a Rich, go ahead. Okay. Um, I have you know this is this just the first portion the fireworks permit hazardous materials storage is not part of yours this time around would you repeat that please is that what you just gave us just the first portion or is there also because i also see on page 10 fireworks permit hazardous material storage tanks oh um those are ones we already have in place that were implemented i believe two years ago so we're just um, requesting to add the one the proposed the motor vehicle dismantling Okay. Well, I guess the, the question I have, um, when you say hazardous material storage tank, is, well, what do you call hazardous material here? Is this the same way the fire marshal causes hazardous materials for um, hazmat fees? Uh, for example, CO2 or high pressure water or... You know, or is this like used oil and that kind of stuff? Um, no, it's typically <laughs> your gasoline, your diesel, your, your propane. Um, out of our Chapter 50, out of the fire code, there's a list of various hazmat, whether it's toxic or flammable or combustible. Um, Okay. I, I, well, I guess I'm confused because that that one's already been a, approved. I need to. I mean, that one's we already been. Already yeah, been the issue here, as I understand it, is the uh, the new one required by the state for dis dismantling vehicles, and then um, the reinspection. So, Rich, did you have a question related to either one of those? Uh, actually, if not, not on, on those two, but the other, the other was sitting there, and well, the company that I am leasing my building to is going to be putting in some tanks, and I'm wondering, you know, on what basis, you know. Uh, oh, I see. Yes, you and uh, I can it, offline on that one, absolutely, and I could let you know. Yeah. Calls okay, under. that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyone else with questions yeah. on these? Yes. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, so, so, Laura, on the motor vehicle dismanding license, is that a like an annual fee for just one facility, or is that per car dismantle? It's for our inspection of the facility, so that um, we also we get paperwork from the state, um, which isn't typical, other than a, for a licensing type inspection. 
Mm -hmm. we, so we get um, we get their form from the state. We make contact with them. We schedule an inspection. We go out with them, do the inspection, write up any issues that we see. Then we do subsequent reinspections if needed, and then we take that paperwork and send it to the state, letting them know they're okay to operate for the next year. And so this would happen every year. And so it's not per car, it's per facility. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a, a, you know, just one, you know, like that I on um, east of Goldfish Farm Road, there's a, you know, wrecking yard or whatever. Like it's being our wrecking. How, how many, how many vehicles do they allow to stack upward? It is getting tall. Like, That's a good question. A lot of yeah. this is. This is new in the fire code, and so because um, we never, we only looked at structures before. We never looked at the site that wasn't in the fire code, so now it is. Um, hmm. More for us to research. Um, so as of right now, it's so new. I don't even know what I'm in, needing to inspect or look at. I mean, obviously, before I go out, we'll look to see what what high points we need to hit. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious. They had a limit of how many can you stack? It's pretty tall. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> Rich, you had a question, Rich? Yeah, I did. Um, well, I guess I had an answer for you. Um, both BNR on Goldfish Farm Road and Pick Apart uh, east of Goldfish Farm Road, uh, let them tall, stack but... up and they'll be stacked up five or six tall. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will be partially crushed at that point. Then about once a month, they come in and bring a crusher and sit in back of my place with the engine screaming and the smell of old dead gas for about four or five days, uh, and then they're gone. Uh, I guess my concern, um, there isn't, you know, the way they do away with, and then maybe this is for, for just the fire department for informational, um, they have basically, if they're going to do away with the gasoline that is in a tank, they pick up the vehicle and they drop it onto a spike that then has a surrounding tank and it kind of splashes into the tank. Um, we'll get, you know, 200 feet away, we'll get the smell of old dead gasoline, and I mean old gasoline, for days on end. And if you can smell it, it may or may not be explosive. But um, I don't know if there is another way for them to deal with that, something that pulls the vapors in better. I mean, if you can't dismiss gas without some kind of a vapor system, I don't see how you could not do something about splashing it around. Anyway, so much for the information. Cool. Peter, you have your hand up? I've uh, had my hand up for the last five minutes. Yes, yeah, the, Councilor Johnson has it. I defer to Alex first. So the question I have about the repeated fire code violations um why are we keeping it at the same level for first degree inspection one two three and four should mm -hmm. we graduate shouldn't we graduate it and send them to fix the problem um my uh yes and actually this because this is brand new to us for the last um two years it's rare that we get past the second fine because usually that first line, people are, are fixing things, or just even the, the threat of it, I hate to use that word, um, that they're going to be fine. They tend to fix things. So we actually um, haven't had to use this too much. Um, so really, I mean, we can be going out every day after like this, the third reinspection, the third fine, I suppose. We so, give about 30 days for the first reinspection. So if we really wanted to, we can be going out the next day so they can find a hundred dollars a day. You know, if they're really not wanting to, I mean, that's not what we want to do. We work with people. So well, I understand that. Like my, my concern is, is that 
you know, if I had enough revenue coming in and it's going to cost me hundred dollars for reinspection, I just paid a hundred dollars. It has to be painful. Um, so I would think about, I would like to see, um, that number go up $50 per event or in the, on the fourth event, especially like when, when I referee a football game, the first ejection, there's no fine. The second, the second injection is a hundred dollars and then it, it graduates up from that. Um, and so I would like to see another scale where it goes from 100 to 150 to 200 to, to 250 or 300. That way we won't have these issues going forward in the future. Councilor Johnson, if you and rest of the council would like, since this will come before you on July 22nd, mm -hmm. uh, we can make a modification and make that an escalating charge if that's your desire. Yes. Counselors? Yes. I can see everybody, so uh, take a straw vote. Alex, you're yes. Bessie? Yes. Yes. And Dick? I, I don't think so. All right. Uh, Rich, you're a yes. Yes. And Mike? You can hear, hear you, Mike. Punch the green button. Yeah. I'm definitely a yes. Well, I am too, so that's five. Uh, so, yeah, Shane, why don't you bring it back to us that way on the 22nd? Okay, we'll do that. Um, can I ask that, the uh, question? So, that's for this repeated code violation. Would you yes. want yes. to see the escalating also for the, the normal, you know, the reinspection fee that we have? Right now, you get no, three inspections for free. That fourth one is when we charge you $100, and subsequently $100 after that. Would you like that scale as well? Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna repeat go out repeatedly go out to somebody's site for whatever issue they may have that's bringing our resources, our police officers out to their site or the fire department, it should it should be painful enough that will incent them to get it fixed so that police officers and fire department won't go there again. Okay. That's you. my position on it. Mike? I, I agree. Eight. Mike? Eight. I don't think that they should be giving somebody four, four times mm -mm. to fix an issue that they've said. After the second time, I think that the fine should start because um, it's unreasonable. I've, I've, I've dealt with the fire department before, and they're not there to just define, but there are some individuals out there that flat will push the envelope. And I believe that, yes. I believe that by saying that we'll give you two inspections, but on the third inspection, it's going to cost you 500 bucks. That's the first number that comes to mind. Maybe that's a little too aggressive, but I think a fine uh, sends a message that number one, we're not fooling around, and number two, you need to come into compliance. And so it's kind of a uh, an education tool that that should be used, and and that's where I stand on it. Peter, maybe you can help me if, if somebody has their hand up because I can't see Alex, Bessie, or Dick. Uh, but do Alex, Bessie, or Dick have any questions? Uh, uh, Bessie has her, her pencil up. Yeah, my, my, I had written on my screen here, the question was that we could ramp up the fines, you know, because I don't, I agree with everyone else that, uh, I mean, why should they do anything if they're not going to be fined? So uh, I agree with give them a warrant, you know, give them the warning the first time and then see if they've done it. And because uh, that that's wasting a lot of time, you know, and uh, there's it could uh, be used for others, you know, can kind of get more inspections done that way and not have to go back to the same ones all the time. Yeah, because I've noticed that people that do push the envelope once they know they're going to be fine, they fix it. So this would save us inspection time. And again, we, we work with people we understand. So we, we do give extended periods for certain things as long as we know they're working on it. 
So it's, it's just a small handful that push the envelope. Uh huh. Well, I think it's time we stop, stop the envelope, <laughs> stuff it. <laughs> Thank you all. All right. Anyone else? Um, Laura, I did have a question. So on this permit for the annual inspection for dismantling vehicles, you said this is coming down from the state. Yes. I'm wondering if we're duplicating some efforts. In other words, what is the state requiring us to do that maybe we're already doing? Um, I'm not looking for additional burden and regulation on these businesses uh, that wasn't there to begin with, but can you explain that? No, I agree. Um, depending on what type of occupancy you have, dictates um, how often we go out there. Like a church or a school, we're going out there annually. A business, like uh, let's say a dentist's office, we're going out there every four years. Something like dismantling, we would probably be out there every three years or every four years. So this is forcing us to go out every year. And right now we're short a deputy fire marshal because we have a frozen position so we actually have less people uh, to do more work so we're going out more frequently on this business than we typically would um, so it's taking away time from other inspections of newer businesses um, as well as the paperwork that's involved with it above and beyond what we normally would do um, as far as you know interacting with the state and their paperwork well, what? Go ahead. Yeah, Peter. Somebody else has their hand up. I was just, I was just going to say, and, and that was the comment that I was going to make earlier. And I would invite Shane or Laura to correct me if I'm wrong. But this is, you know, I don't know how much of a workload this is because I don't know how many auto dismantlers there are in Albany. But this is an example of you often use the term unfunded mandate. So this is a. This is a bar requirement to put on this without any resources to it. And admittedly, it's not, I don't think it's very big, but they have a, a, a tendency to accumulate one over the other, the other over the other. So just a, just a discussion point for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got some back feedback. Um, okay, well, I guess any other comments then we'll vote on this the next council meeting it'll be the 22nd for both items laura yes all right anything else thank, thank you, you. Not, we'll go to kim then thanks laura thank you thanks laura sorry right, about my kim, you're up. sorry about my technical difficulties earlier uh we're rolling with it so Thanks for letting me chat today. Um, so in front of you, you're going to see um, our request to increase fees for um, some of our recreation services um, and rentals. Uh, we were technically approved through the end of this um, biennium, but due to our current financial situation, I felt it was prudent for us to kind of take a step back. Um, take a look to see what our competitors are doing and, and make some incremental um, increases so that um, we're putting ourselves in the best position we possibly can be uh, moving into next year. So I won't necessarily go through all of them, um, but you'll see we have um, increased our frequent customer card, which deals with residents and out of um, non-residents, um, some of our sports program fees, Cool Swanson uh, Park Action Center um, are rates for for those who come and swim, as well as I think the major change is actually at Albany Community Pool. Up until this year, we haven't had a non-resident fee. Everybody has been charged the same fee. Um, and so I've I've asked us to institute so that, that way folks who are, are public and are, um, are feeding into our tax base get the discount. And then just general facility rentals, um, <laughs> increasing those fees as well, kind of uh, across the board between fields, shelter rentals, uh, and and the senior center. Okay. Any Questions? I see Rich. <laughs> and then uh, Bessie. Oh, 
You're muted. There you go. My my uh, question is, how do we, on what basis do we charge? Are we trying to just cover our costs or cover our costs plus make some additional? Um, and uh, can you give me that to begin with, and then I have sure. a follow-up. So at this point, it's covering hard materials and services and basic costs. So any of our frontline <coughs> staff, um, if we are paying a contractor, it pays um, materials, fees, that type of thing. Um, some of the harder costs that have not been in included in our cost recovery model in the past are uh, coordinator time or specialist time, as well as, um, you know, um, the full, we, we haven't drilled it down to how many hours a custodian is going to spend cleaning up after this one activity. Um, right. And so cost recovery models vary uh, from um, department to department uh, within parks and recreation. And my goal is by this time next year that we'd be able to come to you with a fully fleshed out new cost recovery model to kind of show you how each different type of service is going to break down. Um, my goal was hopefully to have that to you this year, but with all of the uh, excitement that has been passed our way unfortunately <laughs> that was not something that we were able to tackle in a timely manner so okay. um, well taking that a step forward looking at senior room senior center room rentals uh, i can recognize that there should be from my perspective two prices price number one is is someone who pays taxes and price number two is someone who doesn't pay taxes to all of them. Um, I mean, it's said a lot of ways, but I mean, if if I want to rent the senior center, the whole thing for five hours, uh, if it's Kiwanis that does that, I pay one price. If it's if it's uh, welding supply that pays that, I pay a different price. If it's me that does it, it's a third price. When the costs of doing so are exactly the same to the city. Um, from for me, the rationale is if you're footing the bill by paying helping to pay your salary and all those people who who um, are helping to do the job, uh, you should get a better deal than the, the person who isn't. I don't see a differentiation for a service club. If they are here in Albany, they should pay the Albany rate. And if they're not here in Albany, uh, they should pay El Blasto, to my way of thinking. I, to do otherwise, to me, is discrimination. Um, giving somebody a better deal because we like what they do is no different than giving someone a better deal because they're the right color or the right ethnicity or the right something else. Um, anyway, I'd like to know what people think about that. I can respond a little bit to that. It's generally, um, it's it's pretty common in, as an industry standard to have a nonprofit rate, a commercial rate, and an individual rate. And so um, that's just kind of something that within Parks and Rec, within the rental sector, that that's kind of the framework that folks work in and that's what people are used to as they as they're going out and looking for a venue. Um, I'm more than happy to go back and revisit and move that into a resident and non-resident rate if we choose to do so. Um, you know, if that's guidance that I get from council. Uh, but this is not um, this isn't a method that we've just created. This is right. An industry standard. Well, with with all the things that are happening on the street these days, I mean it it brings me to the thought that it, should we examine what we do in the way we do them? And if we're going to examine some of it, we ought to examine all of it from my perspective um, and just make sure we're right. Um, so that's where I'm at. Uh, Bessie, I, I hear you had your hand up maybe. Yes, I uh, just had one question, Kim, on the team fees. To go up just 50 cents, I'm thinking, well, that might even, I mean, to go to the even dollar at least uh, might be easier for whoever's paying. I don't know, but uh, I thought 50 cent raise 
Ah, let's go for let's for, go for a buck. <laughs> we can take care of that. I'll make that adjustment. Okay. Thanks. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Alex. So, Alex. so I I was addressing the senior center room fees, room rentals, um, and all of my, all the things I've done, you know, throughout my career and my military career. Nonprofits have typically got a better rate than most folks. So I'm comfortable, I'm not, I'm comfortable with the nonprofit having a better rate because they generally are service clubs that do stuff for the community they serve. Um, so I have no problem with that. Um, I do think that the commercial rate should be higher than both. Um, and I think those numbers are low. That's just me. Um, and so I would have, I'd rather, I prefer that you look at those commercial numbers because when I take my business down to the senior center, if I do business down there, I expect to pay more as a businessman. As an optimist, I expect to pay on the lower end because I'm providing service to the community. So I think the commercial fee should be higher. That's just me. Sharon? So Kim, I was surprised to see, did you say that for our swimming pool, community pool that we weren't charging a non-resident fee? Not at, time. at Cool Pool we were, but not at Albany Community Pool. We should. I think we did that because it was a great, I used to be with the school district. So I'm glad you caught that. I mean, that's about time we're going to start, you know, charging non-residents for using that community pool. So thank you for, for you know, um, getting this implemented. So thank you. Okay, Mike. I kind of agree with Alex that I think that nonprofits that are doing doing work in the city need to have a get a break in uh, in the fees. But I also need I also uh, agree that if they're if people are non-resident, they should if they're not paying taxes like what Rich said, they they need to help foot the bill for what we're doing. Um, I can't speak. go ahead sorry I, um, moving forward is it something that you would like me to look at a nonprofit rate a private resident private non-resident rate and a commercial rate that's that what I'm hearing I like that that's that's good with me good with Richard me too. Uh, because what happens is people from out the city will say, well, it's cheaper to go to Albany and have our event and they're private residents and they're not, but they're not a private citizen, but not a resident of Albany. And if you know, my address is out by ABCP, somebody from Corrales can pay the same thing as I can. That's that's not right because he's not paying taxes or he or she's not paying taxes here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Dick, I can't say it, but do you have any questions, Dick? Uh, I have a comment. I'm wondering, uh, I know that pool attracts uh, um, uh, events, and a lot of people come from out of town. Yes. And I don't know if uh, many of them actually swim in the pool or if they just come to watch. But I would uh, think it'd be um, a shame if we got that pool to be non-competitive because our rates got too high for people that lived outside the city. So I, I think we need to think about it some. Unfortunately, for a lot of those tournaments, they pay um, their own separate fee to rent the space, and then they get to set the admission charges their own, on their own. Um, and those admission charges go to offset the rental fee. But um, so, yeah. So are some or many of those tournaments, uh, do they originate outside our town? And do they yeah. pay an out, would they pay an out of town extra fee because they are out of town? It um, sorry, I'm trying to think through it. Plenty I believe everybody who hosts things are, are residents, you know, in town um, clubs. Okay. And are there, are, there, are there many other pools that we would be competing with? I know ours is uh, Oh, uh, better uh, suited for tournaments than many other smaller ones, and and uh, I, I think it's sort of a plus to our community to have it used uh, on a um, more use rather than less. Yep. Okay. 
So, Kim, do you want to consider making some changes before we vote on this? Sure. Is it something that I should bring it back to the next work session um, before the 22nd? Okay. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. sure, um, I can make I'm, I'm hearing a general consensus that, uh, you know, the taxpayers should get a better rate than, than those coming from out of town. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's maybe the, the main emphasis there. Anyone else with thoughts? Well, the nonprofits too. Discrimination okay, is discrimination, good. guys. You're either all right with it or you're not. In what way, Rich? Explain. Expand. It's really I'm pretty slow. simple. Really pretty simple. If it's okay to charge somebody less, when what we're trying to do is recover our costs, right? So we're going to charge somebody less. That means we have to charge somebody else more for the exact same thing. That's discrimination. Sounds like some uh, rich. Sounds like our tax system. Yeah. <laughs> it's discrimination. Yeah. All right. Anyone yeah. else? All right, I think, Kim, I, I think can, you have, uh, go ahead, Bessie. I was going to say, um, as to what Rich is saying, I, I think there are many tiered uh, fees and, and uh, charges in different areas. So I don't think it's so much discriminating as it's like we have an in-town, a resident and non-resident. And... Um, I just don't think there should there be uh, an issue as far as discrimination, but I, I think it's something that we need to do. Thank you. Well, well all right, giving Cam, somebody you, a, a deal is not a bad thing Go ahead. if taxes or not. Say that again, Rich, you broke up. Giving somebody a deal because they're paying taxes, they're already footing the bill for it. And somebody from out of town, they're not footing the bill for it. Someone who who comes in from the Zonta Club from Corvallis or whatever, um, you know, the fact that we like what they do or not like what they do should not be the reason that we give them a better deal. It is they're using it. They're paying for it. It costs us what it costs us. And if you want to give somebody a better deal, you need to come up with a legitimate reason. The legitimate reason to me is they're already footing some of the bill. That's, that I think is defensible. But to say, well, somebody comes in from out of town and they do it 10 times versus they do it one time, we're gonna give them a deal that's better than somebody in Albany pays, that pays tax. And it, it reminds me of, of the people from, from Jefferson complaining that we were not wanting to subsidize their children at $500 a month to go to the school. I mean, it, you know, they're not footing the bill. I mean, you know, obviously I'm gonna be on the losing side here. I get that, <laughs> and had my say. Rich, I don't think we're talking about people. I'm not anyone that comes from outside would pay more than the local nonprofit, an Albany-based nonprofit. I didn't mean if a person comes outside the city and they're not paying taxes in the city, you can't bring your nonprofit here and pay less than a nonprofit based in Albany. Why yes, not? I agree. Why not? Because yeah. they're not serving. All, if they're serving primary Corrales, they come and here you're for. You're saying their, it has to be a local nonprofit, not I thought, a, I thought, any nonprofit. That's what I thought yeah. I communicated earlier. That is not yes. what it says. It says nonprofit. But it but it also says um, um, for non-residents. So that would be like if somebody's using our community pool or senior center, and if they're not a taxpayer in the city of Albany, then they should be paying at a higher rate. Because if we were we're not a full cost recovery program. We're, we're never recouping all of our costs. 
So we should end up being able to, why should somebody get the same rate as an Albany taxpayer? You know, because if they're getting by cheaper, it's not discriminating. It would be basically discriminating against our Albany residents because they're paying property taxes and paying the same amount to rent a facility that yet they're not paying taxes um, for that facility. So I, I disagree, Rich. I don't think that's discriminating. I think that's basically being a fairness, fair, what's fair and equitable to the Albany taxpayers. Bessie? Well, I was just wondering, Rich, are you just talking about the nonprofits? Is that is that what's concerning you the most? I'm talking about nonprofit and I'm talking about business. I already said that giving somebody a break because because they're here versus someone outside is not discrimination. That is right. a reason a reason to give a discount. I don't agree with having a nonprofit who gets all kinds of better deals anyway to do mm -hmm. something because we have nonprofits who compete with business. We also have business who pay lots of taxes here. They're paying for it already. It's not like they're taking advantage. There's, you know, that was my point. It should be two, two systems. One for people who pay taxes here and one for yeah. people who don't. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with yeah. that. I'm good with that. So I would be moving, sorry, just to confirm then. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so, instead of a nonprofit private commercial rate with having those broken down with resident and non-resident, I right. get rid of all three classifications and it's just resident and non-resident. Right. And if you pay yeah. taxes here, then you get the better rate. Well, whether it's nonprofit or not right and so kim i think the way to prove that is just with the address if with within the city and then that way you can like the library does for the card as well okay so instead of a three-tiered system we're going to a two-tiered system for room rentals resident and resident yeah you know rich it's interesting because I think under your system, the nonprofits should pay more because they're not paying taxes. <laughs> well, but the people, the people in them are paying taxes. I'm talking about a local, I mean, if you look at look at the base for Kiwanis, and it doesn't make any difference what it is. Probably eighty percent of them are from Albany, the ones in Sakina Kiwanis. I don't know about the about the noon club. But the vast majority are from Albany. They're from Albany, they get a better deal. They meet in Albany, they get a better deal. They're paying taxes individually. And the services are local. They're providing right. services. Local. Right. You know, I like uh, Rich's comment from years and years ago when he said, uh, I need a little soak time. And I think that uh, go ahead and, and work on this a little bit, Kim, and bring it back at the next work session. And we will all have had a little soak time <clears throat> and we can see what recommendations you make and we'll kind of keep tweaking a little bit. How's that sound, everybody? Good. Okay. I think that sounds good. You too. All right. Kim. All right. We'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll be prepared. No, that was, and uh, let's give David a try. David's planning. Afternoon. Thank I'm you. here with my colleagues Jeff Blaine and Rob Evans, and uh, looks like we're talking about planning fee adjustments. Jeff, I'm actually going to take the lead here and just give you a brief introduction, and then uh, if you have questions we're happy to answer them the harder they are the more likely they are that david will answer them <laughs> uh, today our presentation is really pretty simple uh traditionally uh
planning fees have been adjusted based on the CPIW, which calculates out to roughly nil this year. And so one option you have in front of you uh, for annual planning fee adjustments is to do nothing, in which case we bring no resolution back to you at a future council meeting. Uh, however, uh, and you, you'll see in that attached memo, uh, last year we spent a good deal of time talking about uh, where planning is at as far as a comparison to revenues, to expenses uh, in different aspects of um, planning functions that the department performs. And you can see from that, you're a long ways away from uh, any sort of cost recovery. And if you look even at just the uh, just the costs related to reviewing applications, you have to increase fees by over 100% in order to, to get there. And that's, uh, you know, I, I, I realize that's not something we're doing today. So the question before you is, do you want to, based on everything that's that's happening around us do our own budget issues uh, the, the larger economic issues what would you like to consider this year for for a planning fee adjustment and there is really no wrong answer it's what you feel is appropriate at this time so I'll turn it over to you for discussion and we'll answer questions um. Mike, I saw your first and then Rich. I think that uh, we should at least at the minimum go with the CPI index, which I think is 2.5% at a minimum, because if we don't at least raise it by that, we're, we're going backwards. And, and a starting point in my mind is, is the CPI index every year, whatever the CPI is, and that's a minimum, but we also need to try to uh, start recovering more of our costs. I understand what Jeff is saying, that we'd have to go at least 100%. We can't do that, but uh, we, can start taking, we can start taking some bites out of that. That's where I'm at. Yeah, thanks for that. Let me follow up uh, real quickly on that. Uh, CP, there's different functions of CPI, and the CPIW, which this fee is, uh, these fees are typically tied to, was roughly zero from April to April. Uh, so the January was two and a half percent from January to January. But January to January was the two and a half percent that you referenced uh, there. So it kind of depends on what time frame you're using. Uh, if you were to not go further behind in cost recovery. You'd have to be looking at a, a increase in the 15% range. Uh, that's uh, for every 1% you increase, you're looking at uh, about $1,300 in increased revenue. So a percent doesn't get you a lot of extra money. And if you're just to try to keep pace with the increased costs of providing the the service, just which is people, uh, that's what what you'd be looking at. You'd be recovering. Uh, if you did, uh, it's 14 to 17 percent range would get you uh, about twenty thousand dollars. So if you don't want to go backwards, you need to be in that 14 to 17 percent range. I have no problem with that. Rich, I guess where I'm at is. Um, COVID-19 is hitting our industry, our, I mean, I'm saying our industry, our city industry uh, in some ways and the outside industry in other ways. I'm wondering, and is there any information out there of what the building trades, uh, what the, what the forecast for building trade is going to be and how much what we do is going to affect that is there is there any third party information on that i'd have to do research that's i i don't i don't know of any off the top of my head well i i guess the issue is the golden goose is New building permits, new new structure, and so forth. You, we don't want to kill that. 
At the same token, we want to cover as many of our costs as we can. So how we can intelligently come up with where that goes, um, you know, what's the, what's the problem going to be if we raise it by 15% or 10% or 5% or 2.5% or, you know, double it. It's, we, we don't know that at this point. Correct. How can we come up with something so we're not just shooting ourselves in the foot or leaving a whole bunch of money on this table, either one? I don't know how to do that at this point. Jaron? I'll probably be the lone voice on this one, but I'll state my opinion again as I have on this issue for. 24 years, I've never liked that and subsidizing out of general fund for new development. The new development does not, and more demand on services, does not pay its way, and we have to subsidize all new development. And popu as more population comes in, we keep going more and more in the hole. If we had 20 years ago, increase the fees to get a full cost recovery, we wouldn't be arguing about it or even having to consider today. We would have been keep keeping up with the cost of living and more communities would have followed suit. We always had the argument about let's, um, we don't want to, you know, outprice ourselves from the market. I've heard that many times. Um, and I'm sorry to say staff, that's been the many times I've heard that argument from staff. Um, but how much more do we keep kicking the can down the road without trying to come up with a maybe a long-range plan or maybe a five or ten year long-range plan to get ourselves in line of more of a full cost recovery um, program for when it comes to development. It's not a community development when it comes to more housing, it's just for one person who buys the house, that's totally different than us subsidizing our um, community programs. I'd much rather have the dollars that we're subsidizing new development to go into keeping our libraries open and being able to keep our parks, you know, um, you know, fully functioning. So we have, we've got to look at some tough choices in the future. It's like what, how much more are we going to be Turning, kind of not really addressing a full cost recovery over one program um, at the expense of others. So I know I'm probably the lone voice on this, but I just have to say my sentiments again. I'll say amen, Sharon. We received that direction and request from the from the council last year, and we haven't forgot about that. We had fully intended to um, to facilitate that discussion with council. Uh, and just similar to what Kim said, this we got pretty derailed <laughs> this year on uh, our abilities, abilities to do something. So uh, we fully recognize and fully intend to bring back that detailed discussion, do the visioning and the and the and the goal setting and the rate projections and those types of things, just like we do on our utilities. Uh, that that needs to happen. Uh, you know. At this, not probably not at the same time, but another effort that needs to be done is looking at the the rate structure itself. Too, are you charging the right for it, the right amount for individual um, applications and review types? But right now, we have a lot more work than people, and we have to stagger the stagger it out. So, uh, unfortunately, we just don't have that to do today. But your your comment is not lost on me. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, David. Um, Mike, before you go, Peter, uh, does Alex or Dick have their hand up? Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> oh, all right, well, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was going to. Part of the pro part of the problem is there is so much government regulation on people that want to build and do things that the cost to do it. So if you want to want to reduce the burden, Sharon, reduce the governmental red tape. Mm -hmm. That that's that's where it ends up being. 
remove remove what's going on up in Salem. Remove what's going on in 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 Washington, where they continually try to take money without any any reason to make it. So it's harder on somebody who wants to do it, and it's harder on the city. So. And, and I do agree with that point on some of what the demands come is something we can't avoid it comes from yeah. state and feds. But but there's a lot of the other costs that we can look at to get more of a full cost recovery. But yeah, we keep getting more shoved on us, like you know, middle housing that we have to you know adopt, adopt rules and implement that cost us money. So I agree with that, Mike. Alex had his hand up. Okay, Jeff, Alex, go ahead. Jeff, did you do you have a number that would at least bring us closer to being? Um, I, I hate using the term whole, but for the cost recovery perspective, can you give us an, a, like a plan, a five-year plan, three-year plan of getting us? Of course, you got to adjust for inflation and things like that, but getting us back to where we're getting ninety percent or eighty-five percent of cost recovery. Because I don't know what that current number is now. Yeah, so there, um, if you haven't had a chance to uh, look at the attachment to today's memo, there's, a, there's an old memo that went to council that talks about the percentages that would be required if you were to make certain leaps. The short answer to your question is yes, we can do that, and yes, we intend to do it. That's what Sharon's asking to have done, and that's, right. that's what you had directed us to do. Uh, we didn't know that we were coming to do this meeting until a couple weeks before uh, it was happening. So that broader, larger exercise just wasn't feasible. Okay. It clearly needs to happen. Council needs to decide what's uh, an appropriate cost to be shared uh, between the community as a whole through the general fund and what costs need to be recovered from developers. Set that target, then we can crunch numbers tell you what that means for rate increases and then, uh, and then we can figure out a transition plan. Somebody's dinner is ready. Somebody. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. So I guess you know, I'm not hearing a, necessarily a consensus here of uh, <clears throat> what council would like to do with this. Well, uh, quite frankly, Mike, like you have some increase. Um, well, let me throw out three options based on what I heard everybody say, and maybe somebody can speak up if they like one of them or not. So <laughs> the, the low end option or the low goal post would be no increase. Perhaps the high end increase would be don't go backwards on cost recovery and consider a 15% increase. And then the middle of the road approach would be to split that and say, all right, we don't want to go, we're not going to go as high as a 15%. We don't like the optics on that. We don't want to go completely backwards. So let's buy some time until we do the larger evaluation, split the baby and, and go somewhere in between. Um, but I'd say that zero to 15 might be the right goal pulse to use in the conversation based on what I heard everybody say. I guess what I don't understand is the, uh, the comment in the in the staff report says having just raised planning fee 7.5 percent. I saw that in July. Talking about a year ago, we raised it 7.58. Um, why does that have any bearing on anything? I mean, I'm certainly not opposed to an annual increase like uh, Mike mentioned, uh, but due to the economy and and some of the issues that Rich brought up. <clears throat> Maybe it's only two or three percent, but maybe two or three percent is not worth it. Yeah. So the seven point five eight percent—that's the memo from last year, right? And the that was the attachment. And the reason that attachment was provided wasn't for the reference to the seven point five percent, but for the discussion about the the details on the cost recovery that are in the farther back in that in that memo. Uh, the reason why council pursued the 7.5, whatever it was, uh, was because that represented our actual, that's what we had to do to not go backwards. So that represented our actual uh, 
cost increases that we were going to incur in order to provide those services. If you're going to take that same approach this year, you'd be in that 15% range. Uh, wow. Mike, why did it change so drastically? That would be over two years, it'd be almost 22.5%, or yeah, it could so be as close to 25%. Why, why such an why such an increase in the last year? Yeah, so two things to keep in mind here. One is uh, percentages get large when you're trying to capture a specific set of a specific amount of money uh, that is let me say that more clear. If I want to if I want to collect a thousand dollars, it's a lot larger of a percent increase if I'm starting with $100 than if I'm starting with $100,000 because that percentage is applied to a, a much larger or smaller number for that fixed amount you're trying to recover. So here you have, for every 1% increase, you have generally a small amount of revenue from, from a city budget perspective coming from the planning division. So every 1% increase only generates uh, about $1,300 in additional revenue. Year to year increase, you have a few things that are driving staff costs. You have increases in, so, um, increases in healthcare costs. You have the, the PERS increases that we're dealing with. You have employees who have uh, annual, perform, uh, annual adjustments based on cost of living or if they're uh, newer employees, they might have steps because they've gained experience. So when you look at the group, you need to collect about $20,000 more uh, in order to cover all of those costs for those staff uh, that perform those services. So when you do that math, uh, it gets you in that 15% uh, range. Was that unclear? You're looking like I didn't make sense there, Mike. No, I'm I am running things through my mind that, uh, like we said earlier, we need some soap time and there's some information that um, I would like to see. Um, okay. I'd like to see how we arrived at that, that percentage based on the dollars. Um, basically, maybe an Excel spreadsheet that shows, uh, shows that. Um, because a fifth, you know, I'd go for the CPI right now, but uh, I'd have trouble going for the 15% unless I got a whole lot more information on uh, on a breakdown in the percentages year over year and the costs. And because the other thing that can happen is like what Rich says, we start driving those fees up. We're going to start losing. We're going to start losing development. And we're going to start losing contractors going to other places. And developing is not going to happen. So um, this is a delicate balancing act, and I think, like on the other app issue, we need some soak time. Yeah. I agree with you, Mike. I agree with you, Mike. Uh, one of the you know that plays both ways. Uh, if we don't collect enough revenue, and it um, as it relates to general revenue collections and we don't can't staff at the level we want to our review go up uh, and as you know very well time is money uh, for the for developers and, and businesses and so the longer it takes um, uh, the more they're they're losing money on that front too so all of these things are interrelated and it's a very difficult balance as a number of you have said uh, I'm very happy to to bring back any uh, information that you need in order to, to make an informed decision. I, th there really isn't a right or wrong answer here. Well, along those, I'm sorry, I'm dominating the conversation. What if, what if that was outsourced to a third party? Is does that cost more? Or does that cost less? Or what's the impact of doing that? <laughs> Yeah, so different analysis. I've never done that on the planning side. When we've done that in public works before, it was more expensive to uh, outsource. Um, you'd, you'd also have to do one of two things. You'd have to basically uh, hand over 
control from a quality standpoint and a decision making uh, standpoint to some degree, uh, or you have to still pay staff to manage uh, contracts and consultants and those types of things. And um, that, that can sometimes be more work than just doing it yourself. Uh, Bessie? Yeah, I was going to say, um, I am against uh, outsourcing it. There's been many instances where cities outsource something. I think Eugene did it one time with their, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was some sort of a maintenance, maybe park maintenance or something. But they ended up where the outsourcer paid their their employees so little and they didn't have the training and the city ended up having to take it back. And so there's a real danger in outsourcing something that we need to keep an eye on. Thank you. I got a question for Peter. Um, you've got your finger on the pulse uh, better than any of us uh, in terms of the budget and the challenges uh, moving forward. And uh, Sharon brought up a good point about uh, the general fund and how this program is uh, supported by the by the general fund. I'm guessing uh, that any increase would be helpful, Peter. Uh, your thoughts on that? Absolutely. And um, it's interesting to look back to July of 2019 when it was 7.58 percent, and to hear Jeff talk about uh, if you wanted to do a comparable thing now, it'd have to be in the neighborhood of 15 percent because that that portends that you know you may see that in in other parts of the general fund budget as well and we we have talked for years now about uh our uh, property tax revenue being pretty much limited to three percent growth whereas the growth in the cost of government has been at five percent or greater so 7.58 last summer wasn't a surprise uh 15 percent given PERS and other cost drivers uh, also isn't a surprise. So this, this like the TLT uh, example was a, a harbinger of things to come. This, this might very well be the same thing. Another well, thing I'm going to guess. That was Jeff, I think. Go ahead. Oh, Bill. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was just saying if. The other thing you could do is, is you know, these, these go to public hearings. The other thing you could do is direct us to uh, prepare two resolutions and get public testimony on them. Uh, that's always available to you as well. Well, I think there's consensus for, uh, and Dick, I see your hand here. I'll just finish. Uh, I think there's consensus for some kind of an increase, uh, but it's somewhere between <laughs> between zero and 15 percent so uh i guess massage that and, and uh mike i think said maybe a little soap time or something but uh dick uh what, what are your thoughts yeah yes uh, thank you i uh, i think the raises ought to be uh, uh more on the higher side rather than the lower side uh, i don't think the public ought to uh, have to pay for this through the general fund which would mean that they uh, would have less in the way of parks, less in the way of libraries, less in the way of that kind of stuff. And um, I have to agree with Sharon that uh, growth in the city uh, does not uh, mean that uh, taxes are going to go down. In fact, I think if you look at the tax rates, of course, the tax rates are fixed by what the uh, voters did back with uh, Measure uh, 550 and whatever the other one was. But, uh, and I have to agree with, uh, with uh, 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 Peter that uh, our, our income is fixed by what happened back there in the late 90s. And our costs uh, continue to escalate uh, because uh, uh, as a society, uh, we don't uh, take care of uh, retirement. And so PERS continues to go up and up and up. And as a society, we don't take care of health care for everybody. So our insurance costs go up and up and up. And it leaves uh, less and less for things that need to be done. 
So I'm afraid, I'm afraid we're going to have to let the uh, builders and the contractors and the uh, promoters uh, pay more for their SDCs and other fees. So I, I'm in favor of raising uh, the various uh, development costs. Alex, uh, Alex, I can't see uh, any thoughts. Well, my my concern is is that we need to make sure it makes sense because they're going through the same things we are right now as a city. Ours ours a lot more stark because we're a city and they're an individual uh, employer. Um, there should be an increase. What what that looks like, I'll trust Jeff and his team to come back with something. Uh, I think fifteen percent is high, uh, but then that's just. Me. Um, but I would appreciate knowing a number or at least his thoughts on the number he can bring back. Uh, to the city council for us to evaluate and consider and i know it's difficult and everybody's going through pain right now but it, it's something where we have to at least recoup some of the some of the costs that we spend doing the work of the city for for people that want to develop in town what number makes sense i don't know but i do know that it's going to be difficult and people are not going to like us but we have to make decisions for the betterment of the city long term and if we can't we can't allow us to keep going backwards when incremental steps forward will be very beneficial in the long term. Hey, Rich. I guess I keep hearing we got to stick it to the developers and uh, you know, I guess, do you just not understand? They don't pay the fees. The homeowners do. The homeowner pays the fees. The person who buys the house no matter how much we charge, whatever it is, the developer gets a hold of the money and says, okay, that's now part of the price of doing business, and he has to put it in the price of the building. I mean, that's who actually pays it. Not done by the developer or by the real estate agent. They all, yeah, the money goes through them, but they just collect it and then charge for it. Now, that argument makes perfect sense if the home buyer has unlimited funds to buy the house, but they don't. Are you daft, man? <laughs> Look, don't you understand where the here. money comes from when you build something? I mean, the builder has to charge for it. That's where they get their money. Well, if he charges Whereas too me, much, I can't buy it. If he charged me $1,000 for something and I sell whatever that is, I have to get the thousand dollars. I mean, that's just yeah. life. Business does not now, nor has it ever really paid tax. It only collects it. That's why the that's why the legislature made the 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 cap tax, so they could blame other people when the prices went up. I don't agree. Hey, I know you don't agree, Dick, but guess what happens? Rich is absolutely right. The, it goes on the cost of doing business and it's passed on to the homeowner. And when the homeowner can't buy housing, they're homeless. And then what happens is what happened in Portland and you got that bill by your Democrat comrades that <laughs> supported middle housing, the bill you hate. The net effect of middle housing and what's going on is because the cost for the developers were being passed on to the homeowner, couldn't afford it, so now they're building smaller and smaller homes and more packed in and packed in and packed in because they can't afford to, to, to buy a home because of what the government has done to them. And it starts in Salem. And that's the bottom line. All right. Um, we need to move this up here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Jeff, you've kind of got uh, some information that uh, consensus is an increase. We just want to see maybe some options. 15 is too high and, and zero is too low. Uh, and maybe uh, a little sidebar with people. Uh, on how it impacts general fund and come back to us with another proposal. How's that sound? Uh, would, would you like us to, you want us to come back to a work session and tell you what we, you want a specific proposal? 
I think so. And then if it if it warrants a public hearing, we can schedule that. But let's uh, take it a step at a time. Will do. And then Rob, talk about some fee adjustments. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So public works fees, we're going to switch here real quick. I don't know if you can see me any better, but so for public works fees, we are talking about system development charges and uh, connection fees, and lumped in with connection fees is post construction uh, stormwater quality fees. Um, so there's a total of eight separate fees between those two. So that, let's talk about SDCs quickly. Um, Three FTCs, water, wastewater, transportation. Uh, it's a couple of different uh, increases that um, that uh, we can discuss tonight. The first is inflationary increase, um, and for transportation, that's uh, a little over one percent for the uh, engineering news record construction cost index. Um, and that fell on the table on page 17. And for water and wastewater SDCs, um, there's not only an inflationary adjustment, but there is also uh, a yes. increase to consider. And quickly, if we remember last year for water and wastewater, we increased these based on looking at the projects and um, inflating those projects, we developed a, a new maximum allowable fee. That was a quite a large increase, so council decided to phase in that, those increases for water and wastewater. And last year we implemented the first phase, the first step of that phasing process. So this year, we can consider whether we want to take the next step in that phase-in process for water, for wastewater SDC. So that's what's summarized on the first table on page 17. Um, I can answer any questions about SDCs before we go on to the next page and look at the community comparison. All right, any questions from anybody? And Alex, I can't see you, but I can see everybody else. All right, go ahead and go on, Rob. So I'm good, on to, I'm good to, uh, Bill. There is a table that we borrowed from the city of Millersburg. Um, they are in the middle of an SDC update. And uh, we like this table because it touches on um, what we were ta talking about just a few minutes ago, passing on the SDCs in the price of a home. Uh, and that's what this table captures. It lists, for various cities in the Big Valley, it lists their rank in, in order of their total SDC charge. And coupled with that are the medium home prices for those cities. And then the very right-hand column, there's a percent SDC, what percent SDC is included in that medium home price. So we kind of meshes those two together. And you can see Albany uh, is in the middle toward the bottom. So that's just kind of food for thought to see where we where we land with other cities. Um, wow. So look so follow through with the rest of the fees, there's the um, uh, connection charges, and that's listed on the bottom table, and that is again using the ENR for the last year, uh, about one, a little over one percent, one point oh five percent. There's not much of an increase, um, and in fact, some there's no increase. Uh, just um, there is in the calculated fee, but not the fee that we're charging. All right, is that it? Councillor uh, Johnson recommended for the parks fee where they rounded up to the nearest dollar. That's what Rob's referring to. The fee we charge is a, a rounded charge. We wouldn't charge 
four dollars and eighty three cents, we'd charge five dollars. That makes my sense. thought is uh, every year we have the ENR, so uh, I think we ought to continue on that path. What's everybody else think? I agree. I'm seeing a lot of heads nod, so Rob, it looks like maybe uh, we'll come back or we'll, we'll vote on that Wednesday for uh, to follow the ENR uh, rate increase. Does that make sense? Yeah, on the, uh, the last council meeting of the month, the 22nd. Uh, if not in two days, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, we, we'll public hearing that we need to post. It so will yeah, be the next so. regular council meeting uh, following this, the one this week. Okay. And when you, I want to make sure we're clear that you want the ENR index, but also do the next step in the phase in of the water and sewer SDCs, or you will, you want to consider that separately now? Well, personally, I just want the ENR. I'm trying to uh, take into account the economy and so forth. And, you know, both Rich and Mike bring up a good point. <laughs> We can go down this road a long ways today, but this isn't a time or place. But it's talking about affordable housing because all these costs do get passed on to the homeowner. Uh, they're not uh, absorbed by the developers. In fact, in my business, you take all of these fees and, and then you mark it up for overhead and profit, and uh, you're actually making money on some of these fees. So, um, it's no different than the the one percent fee they passed in Portland, uh, some kind of a business tax, and Safeway started putting it on the receipt where people could say it. And it's like, well, that isn't what we intended. It's like, well, <laughs> Safeway's not going to absorb the one percent; they're going to pass it on to the customers. So, um, I'm I'm just thinking for this year, uh, I would be in favor of just the ENR increase. Um, that's my thoughts. I'm I'm one of six. So. You make that two or six, three. Make that four. For some, reason, for some reason, I lost everyone. We can hear you. Well, we can so see we'll you got four that. anyway. Bring we'll that bring back on the twenty second our increase. And uh, and move forward with that this year. Uh, food for thought, though. Um, the, the public ends up paying for it one way or the other, whether it's the homeowner when they buy it and pay that SDC, or whether um, they end up paying through it, their rates because whatever we don't collect through SDCs, we have to later collect through rates. It's it's a the, the it's a sunk cost that, that we have to uh, um, respond to to construct those facilities to respond to growth. So happy to just bring forward the AMR. I just don't want to lose sight of that that uh, that relationship yeah thank you Jeff all right uh, if there's nothing else then I guess we're gonna have our uh, executive session is that correct How about five so Bill do you have this all right I know. Um, I have script uh, rich would like a break so why don't we uh, make it four and a half <laughs> Make it as short as possible. Bill, Bill, do you have the script? Yeah, I do. It. Okay. Can anybody hear me? Should we yeah. Hand? yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Can't hear anybody. <laughs> Hey, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, once you read the script about uh, the people that are going to be staying, I'll go ahead and look at the uh, attendance list and then uh, remove anybody that is not part of that. You want me to read? You want me to read it now? No, no, no. When you get to the time when the meeting starts again, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, hey, give me give me a couple minutes just or a minute to look at the list and and and. Uh, 
have the people that need to leave I'll leave and then we'll just uh, lock the room virtually and then um, I'll open it up once the executive session is over gotcha gotcha okay yeah. All right, do I need to excuse myself? Uh, no, you can stay. Staff can stay. Well, yeah, I'm looking like if Rebecca and Lisa are still there, they might as well leave. Because uh, we're just going to come back and read that message and, and lock them out. Correct. <laughs> I don't know who Sean Kidd is. Is that some citizen or something? Or? He chooses to remain anonymous for the most part. So, where is Oh, what is he? There he is, yeah. He was playing he some pretty sweet prediction. tunes in the background earlier. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> Your background music earlier. When was that? Oh, I heard much earlier in the, yeah. in the meeting. It wasn't mine. Oh, it, it said you were talking when the when the music was playing. So that's weird. Yeah, that's why I, I can't muted yourself. What it was but it was pretty. I rough. thought the thing was muted. That's weird because I don't have any music on, and that would have been in my phone. But I'm on the I'm on the iPad. Oh, it was weird. The music uh, what kind of music was it? I don't know. You know, it, I think it was like oldies rock or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe he was just sitting. <laughs> well, define oldies rock first of all. Well, what, what, yeah, what I, but, yeah. well we're we're around the same age though, so I know that's what I'm saying. So, <laughs> uh, no. I can hear you, Alex, to answer your question. I think my headset died because I I was like I couldn't hear anybody. I could see you guys moving, talking, but. For some reason, they're not working. We'll figure it out. Another, in other hammer. words, our lips were moving, but you didn't hear nothing. Right. Oldies rock is uh, what your parents listen to. So, you know, <laughs> it's not oldies. It's... <laughs> right, yeah. I don't know. The oldies stations now include the 1980s in their in their uh, oldies, which makes me feel old. So. Yeah. Dad's the uh, Beatles were just a a fad. <laughs> they were going to be a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, them damn kids in their long hair. Okay, when Sharon gets, uh, I, I think we can start. Sharon. And Bill, uh, uh, just to let you know, I, I locked the room, and everybody that is in the on the list uh, here on, on the virtual list here, it's uh, is okay to stay. Oh, okay. Okay, so Sharon's back, so uh, we'll uh, get started again. The city council will now meet in executive session for the purpose of discussing employment evaluations per ORS 192.660I. Representatives of the news media and designating staff and other persons shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the go-to meeting at this time. Jorge, if you'll uh, unlock the go-to meeting, let me know when you've done that. Okay, Bill, it's unlocked. All right, so I reconvene the regular session at 6.07. Uh, we don't have any motions, so uh, how about uh, counselor comments, uh, Rich? Yeah, I do. I, you guys probably also got some emails from people about masks. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. I happen to think. Yeah. So, who's going to be the arbiter of of who gets bashed up alongside the head for not wearing a mask? Um, it's, you know, is that our police? Um, or, you know, we're kind of in new territory here. Mm -hmm. And something I, I thought of, there are people with COPD or with some um, respiratory issues that have a real issue wearing a mask. Um, and whether or not wearing a face shield, uh, which would give them 
then free access, uh, no, no problem breathing, um, would be good enough. Uh, and I don't know who this would be directed to. Um, I, it seems to me if we can allow face shields instead, of masks that we let people know we are okay with. That's it. I think face shields are an acceptable, acceptable use, though, right? isn't there? Because I know some of the vendors I, downtown might allow those. I think they are rich. For uh, I remember reading about they can be used if people do have COPD yeah. or other health yes. issues. Well. Then which kind and Yeah, my what. clients use face masks as well. Yeah. Well, it depends whether or not if, if you have COPD or some other respiratory problem, um, it's a big deal. Um, you know, exertion means you're just that much more of a restriction on something where you're having a problem anyway. So, um, I mean, I don't know who. Okay. Who, okay, that's it. Mike, anything? Well, I saw, saw the things on the face masks and and the kind of we're in different territory, and we're going to have to tread lightly. The other one is I've been getting emails, and I think Dick has too, from an individual that's complaining about um, neighbors having uh, fires at night uh, in yes. their in their uh, I don't know what you call it. They're little burn pits or the little fire pits, and the yep. smoke's getting into her house, and she wants us to regulate um, backyard fires because the smoke's getting into her house at, at night. And I don't know if that's something that we can we can do. Uh, and just tell everybody they can't have a backyard barbecue. They can't have a backyard fire pit. They can't do any of that. In this time when everything's shut up and shut down, um, it seems it seems uh, that going down that road to me is is uh, not something that we need to do. But I don't know how to how to address the lady and and do something. I don't because I don't think there's anything that we can can do. And boy, somebody's really having fun out there. I Oh, that was noisy. So, Mike, we regulate did regulate all of that. Yeah, Mike, we did look at this about oh, a good 20 years ago. So, we did come up with an ordinance. And if I remember right, it was um, you could not do a wood burning backyard during like the fire, um, you know, like a wood burning recreation. It was a recreational fire pit during the fire season, you know, when it was declared that no more backyard burning, but it was. If you had, I think it was like an acre or le less of property. So um, it never did pass by the council. It's never been brought up. But nowadays, there's a lot of the um, backyard fire pits that are gas now. You know, there's it's, you've got a lot more options than using the uh, wood burning. But this was for recreational fires. And then we have had in our code, the you know, if, if fire chief was here what the code was you have certain distance now from like fences or um, a house things like that but but it is an issue I mean I hear complaints from people about you know the recreational backyard wood burning if they it just you know in the summertime you open up your windows and it's all of a sudden in an evening you're smelling somebody's burning wood but which isn't as necessary now because of the you know, gas fire pits. You can get the same as you can get a gas fireplace instead of a wood burning stove anymore. But um, so yeah, I mean, you can. We can't have an ordinance. We had we had one drafted up years back, but it, it never did pass. I yeah, and uh, I've gone by the house uh, a couple of times, and no fires were burning at the time. And I uh, plan to go a couple more times, and. Uh, uh, unless I go by and there's really an egregious amount of smoke, I'm going to uh, contact the lady and I'm going to suggest to her that I'm afraid she's in a minority and most of my constituents are 
they're going to say is that they're not bothered by wood smoke. But, uh, that, that's my plan at this point. Um, if I could add something. Um, this is Matt Harrington, by the way. Um, okay. So <laughs> uh, as far as the, the AMC goes, uh, like Sharon said, uh, we don't have anything on the books currently, but as far as the state's concerned, uh, recreational burning like in a fire pit is exempt from open burning uh, laws and that's under a Oregon administrative rule and uh, revised statute, so. So, so people so can't. What are the time limits on that then? What's that? Time limits? What no. are the time limits on those rules? There's there's no time limit. Um, there's uh, required separations from a structure, um, for instance, yeah. like 10 feet for a barbecue or fire pit, um, and certain materials that they're allowed to burn, but uh, in a maximum size in height and diameter. But it doesn't uh, say anything about um, time of day or anything like that. Well, I was thinking about time of year. No, it doesn't. They're exempt from that. Uh, the rest what what we commonly think of as the restricted period. Um, yeah. That's the DEQ uh, state fire marshal uh, period. But as long as it's a small, you know, residential fire pit that's no more than three feet in diameter and two feet in height, they're exempt from time of year. You know, I think it would yeah, be thank you. an update from our fire chief, because I do see where there's calls of like illegal burn or, because they will enforce if it gets up too high. So yeah, maybe I can, we have a, um, sort of, uh, fire, you know, it'd be nice to know from the chief. Fire, yeah, the uh, fire department actually, I'm getting this information from their uh, open burn uh, trifold that's available online. I'll send that link out. And okay. Mayor, okay. Yeah, I'd like a copy of that. Mayor mm -hmm. Matt, I, my I get, is, No, that. Um, other than I'd like to get back to in-person meetings. Um, <laughs> I like these. somehow, some way. Um, this gets this type of meeting gets frustrating for me. But that's all I've got other than that. All right. Dick, how about you? Bill, I think Peter had something to say. Just, well, I just, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. 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 Just uh, back to the uh, open uh, fire. Um, Laura Ratcliffe and Shane Wooten have been talking with uh, DEQ and the state fire marshal today about it. So they, they're looking into it. And as, as Matt alluded <laughs> to, um, there, there are some uh, restrictions that the state operates under, and if if the fire is a nuisance, if it can be proved to be a nuisance, then then the state can do something about it. But I would just ask you to give us a few days to 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 run this down, and then we'll get back to you about what's possible. Okay. That'd be All great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dick. It was your turn. Anything else? Uh, no, I don't believe so. All right, Bessie. I just want to say, talking about uh, um, internet hacking and stuff, I got hacked last week and had to take my computer in to be totally cleaned and wiped out. So, um, yeah, it does happen. And uh, it's frustrating because you think, oh, this is something that looks, like Sharon says, it looks like it's something. And it's not. And, uh, it's it's embarrassing to know that you got caught by it, but you know it happens and go from there. But other than that, just uh, you know, everybody stays well and safe because it sounds like we're not uh, out of the woods yet on this virus. Okay, Alex. Alex, are you there? Any other thoughts? He's uh, we frozen. Can't. And I just, his picture's frozen. Yeah, he was having problems, so uh, I, I, we'll just move on. I don't have anything, Sharon. Um, the only thing I did is I had a lot of complaints about the amount of fireworks. So um, hopefully, if next year we can get back to having our outdoor display, it'll lessen maybe the amount throughout the whole community. But 
Um, so there was quite a bit citywide, I mean, a lot of the illegal fireworks. So, and even I had this chunk my husband found on our deck, back backyard oh, deck. Yeah. So it was a huge one of those spraying kind and evidently that went, we knew it was on one side street, it had to have gone a hundred and some feet, but I have a big 50 year old fir tree that was just right under that deck. And <laughs> if it'd been drier weather, it's kind of scary on a lot of those illegal fireworks, but oh, they're awful. I talked to see this big chunk that came through, you know, on our deck, and it left debris all over our, back deck too so but um i don't know what an easy solution is if it needs to be at the state level but people i heard they could buy the legal fireworks online and have them delivered so um just um it, we have for enforcement we can't keep up and it's been getting worse every year so i don't know an easy solution but i know it's really kind of flaring a lot of people's emotions and patience. And I even had a video I had posted of my poor cat inside that was literally, yes. you know, was just on, crawling on the floor. She was so traumatized, so. But it is hard on people's pets and and all that. So don't know what we can do about it, but uh, but I, I, I can understand a lot of concern. I agree. That that's it. Anything else? Okay, Peter. Uh, just just a little bit of good news, and to let you know that um, we've received a uh, a uh, amount of money in the amount of six hundred and twenty six thousand dollars as part of our CARES CARES Act reimbursement. Right. So that's the first uh, round of reimbursements. We'll we'll, we'll be uh, making other claims. Uh, uh, in the in the near future, and and look forward hopefully to uh, getting reimbursed again. Nice, nice. Uh, thank okay, you. Okay. Yeah, uh, Rich. Hey, when, uh, Bessie brought up the COVID nineteen thing again. Um, and something has been occurring to me here lately. We're getting kind of one side of this whole thing. Um, Example, Lynn County. I can't hear you, Rich. Please talk into the microphone. It's in front. Can you hear me now? Much better. Oh, okay. Move over a little bit. Um, the COVID-19 thing in Lynn County, we as of a few days ago, we had 140 cases. And that's what we keep hearing, and that's what you keep seeing on on media. Well, reality. 77 of those people got better. We had 50 some cases that were active. We don't, so when each time there's a new case, there's a big thing made out of it, but we don't ever hear the people that got well. We see this primarily at the national level is the, you know, cause I, well, I think they have an agenda, but beyond that, uh, when we do it internally, when we talk about it internally, can we have all the information? So it's not just how many we have had and how many deaths. Yeah, we've had nine deaths. Well, I think seven of them were from one location. And by giving just the 140 and the nine, uh, use the thought process. Um, and I would appreciate it if we had. Yeah, 77 of them got better, or 81 got better, or, you know, whatever it is, uh, if that's within our control. And that's all the rest I have. Thanks. Uh, Rich, I, I, I appreciate the comment. However, it's the county that tracks the public health information, and they're the ones that would would have that information if it was available. Well, I'm talking to primarily yeah. The HIPAA rules, too, Rich, they can't date you know where the person was and it's really hard kind of locating where where it did have you know where somebody well, did get um a case if it, doesn't, if it doesn't keep you from saying how many people got better it says joe schwartz got better or didn't get better but it, it yeah that other I mean, information is no. now out there it's just not published 
try. Just it'd be nice. Okay, to know well, minutes long. Uh, can we? I, yeah. Hey, uh, Bill, I just have yeah. a, a, a quick comment on the question that uh, Councilor Syke uh, asked at the beginning of the meeting. Um, the address uh, 11, uh, 1124 Lakewood Drive Southwest. So I did send an email to Matthew Luther, he's our development service manager, and he says that uh, we do not have any permits in our system to that address. Uh, we will open a compliance case and initiate a discovery inspection. Thank Very you. good. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And I Wednesday. And with that, uh, we're done. Thanks, Bill. Thank good you, everybody. Good job, Bill. Uh, thanks, Bill.